It was a devastating fire early on October Saturday morning. Six people, including four young children, died in this arson at this two-story row home at 6 and Glenwood Avenue in North Philadelphia. And now federal authorities have charged feared drug kingpin Cavani Savage and three associates with nearly a dozen murders, including the six that occurred on that October morning. They murdered their drug dealer rivals. They murdered witnesses. Witnesses in state court, witnesses in federal court. They murdered the families of witnesses, including children. The feds say that Savage and his cohorts set the arson to silence former associate Eugene Coleman, who may have been cooperating with authorities. The six dead were Coleman's relatives, including his mother. A crime officials say could earn the conspirators a well-deserved death penalty. All I can say is just pure evil. That's what describes the actions of Cavoni Savage and his gang of thugs. Tears of rage. I'm flooded. I'm, I'm flooded internally from him. Almost drown myself every night, man. Tears of rage because these sons of bitches going to pay, man. They're going to pay or my name ain't what it is. My pop name wasn't what it was. They going to pay. They kids going to pay. They mama's going to pay. I know you get tired of me saying it, man. But that's the kind of conviction I got for this shit, man. I'm dedicated to their death, man. They better hope and pray I go to jail for a long time. It don't matter. Because while I'm still living, I'm going to get them. Was he Philly's most brutal kingpin? This is a tale of one of Philadelphia's most dangerous men, according to federal prosecutors. It is the story of one kid's dreams to be a kingpin at all costs. When it was all said and done, there would be 13 murder convictions tacked to his belt. No one was off limits in Philly if they crossed the kingpin. Kibani's story is more than what you read in fiction books. Even more so, this is not fiction, nor a movie, but all facts. Perhaps he was gifted the right last name for who he would become, a savage, some would say. In September 1999, Kebani Savage would be charged with his first murder. Kebani would walk into a Philadelphia state courthouse charged with first-degree murder. With those charges looming, the consequences were high. With money, power, and high-priced lawyers, he would be acquitted in March 2004. But was it the lawyers or was it the key players on the streets? Like in all prosecutions, the state would have to turn over the names of their witnesses before trial. The prosecution would do so and it would cost someone their life. That somebody was the only person that could put Kebani at the scene of the crime with a smoking gun in his hand. On the eve of Kebani's trial, Tybius Tib Flowers took his last breath. He too had become a victim of the KSO crew. The violence was only starting. There was a lot more to come. January 1st, 1975 was the day he entered the world with a bang. He would, according to federal prosecutors, become an American drug dealer, organized crime leader, and murderer. He lived that life and was about that business where the streets of Philly can be as ruthless as a starving pit bull. As a child, he was an amateur boxer that would go on to have one professional fight that he won. But boxing was not in the cards for Kebani. He had bigger dreams, or so he thought. His life of crime and drug dealing began in Hunting Park. With the mind of an aspiring young entrepreneur, it would not be long before he would reach the top and become Philly's kingpin. Kebani Savage and his partner, Gerald Thomas, ran a massive cocaine and crack manufacturing and distribution organization in Philadelphia that the Fed say started in the late 1990s and would end in April 2003. It was not a short run and not really a long one. With violence at every step of the case, it would not be long before the Feds would zero in on Kaibani. Everyone knew who he was and there was pressure to get him off the streets. Sometimes pressure bursts pipes, other times it creates diamonds. In this case, the pipes were ready to burst. You see, Kebani had a stash house in an apartment at the village of Stony Run in Maple Shade, New Jersey. And this is when it all really started. That is where they would re-rock kilos of cocaine. On a chilly September day in 1999, cops would search the apartment finding scales, packaging materials, four metal presses, seven metal press molds, two hydraulic jacks, cans for household items with false bottoms, and cocaine. Kebani had become the master of re-rocking coke, increasing his profits. On that day, Kebani would be arrested along with Eugene Coleman and two others, Elliot Bradley and Jasmine Vidal, on local drug trafficking charges. Later that evening, while standing outside the Maple Shade Police Department cell block, where Savage, Bradley, and Coleman were being housed, there was an agent, Agent Lewis, standing in the distance. He would overhear a conversation among the three men. Coleman told Savage that Savage should have taken responsibility for all the cocaine processing materials 
found in the apartment at the time of their arrest. Savage replied that he wouldn't do that unless the police guaranteed that Bradley and Coleman would walk out of jail without being charged. Savage said that the police would not do that, so he would not admit to anything. I'm not telling those people that shit was mine. Savage told Bradley and Coleman not to worry because their bail would be, would be paid for them, but that they should not talk to law enforcement about the items found in the apartment, and that they should take it to their graves. Savage told Coleman and Bradley that we know what we do for a living, and when we get out, we'll just start the shit all over again. Savage would eventually be released from custody and placed on house arrest at his mother's house on North Darien Street in the summer of 2000. But that arrest would not stop his drug dealing. Kebani thought he was unstoppable, but the feds, they had bigger plans. From his mother's home on Darien Street, he was back in business. The streets had too much money for him to leave there. Kebani thought he was unstoppable, but the feds were there to try to stop him. They too had started an investigation. Coleman, not true to his words, to Savage inside the cell block, that he would keep his mouth shut, would soon meet with law enforcement seeking a deal. He would later outline the inner workings of Kebani's organization. Eugene Coleman was now one of the government's instrumental cooperating witnesses. Coleman would meet with law enforcement outlining the inner workings of Kebani's organization. Coleman's assistance would help secure a wiretap to Thomas's cell phone from September 2000 through March 2001, during which thousands of calls between Thomas, Savage, and some of the co-defendants in this case were intercepted. Those calls would also lead to a warrant for Kebani Savage's phone. It was not long before federal agents learned that Wendell Mason was the cocaine supplier to Thomas. The intercepted calls would show that Savage was the leader of an extensive operation that moved hundreds of kilograms of cocaine in and around the great state of Pennsylvania. Those calls would also lead to a warrant for Kebani Savage's phone. Based off of those calls, it was not long before federal agents busted into Wendell Mason's home. There, they would find five kilograms of pure cocaine and 350,000 in cold cash. On April 13, 2004, the feds had had enough. They came knocking. The cold metal from the handcuffs would bite Kebani's skin, and in that moment, his fate would be sealed. Would he die in prison, or would he find a way out of this one? Only time would tell. The feds knew they were playing with a savage and that everyone could become collateral damage. The feds held back nothing and went hard in ways that you think only comes from movies. On October 26, 2004, a federal judge in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania signed an order authoring interception of oral communications of Savage's prison cell and surrounding access spaces. The feds had got into the jail and they were ready to record. The interception equipment was installed on November 3rd, 2004 and monitoring commenced from that day until December 2nd, 2004. Continued interception was authorized on December 7th and terminated on January 6, 2005. During the time periods of the authorized interceptions, Savage and his neighboring cellmates, primarily Al Shannon Moose and co-defendant Dewad Bay, communicated frequently over the course of the day, and Savage often communicated to others through the toilet bowl to inmates in other prison cells. The cops had tapped his prison cell, and during those months, Kebani would give them more than they could bargain for. Kebani would lay out plans in disturbing detail to eliminate witnesses and their families. And he was not bluffing. Again, no one was off limits. If you cross Kebani, he would be there to retaliate. Kebani had finally put two and two together and determined that Eugene Coleman was in fact cooperating against him. Again, he was thirsty for blood and had soldiers in the street to make it happen. On a cold October 9, 2004, the city of Brotherly Love, the fire department there, would respond to a fire at the 3200 block of North 6th Street. When the units arrived, they observed the house at 3256 North 6th Street, fully engulfed in flames. The flames would dance from the roof. After extinguishing the flames, fire department officials would find six bodies in the upstairs bedrooms. The victims were identified as 54-year-old Marcella Coleman, the mother of Eugene Coleman, her 33-year-old niece, Tamika Nash, Coleman's adopted sister, Nash's 10-year-old daughter, Khadija Nash, Marcella Coleman's grandsons, Demir Jenkins, who was only one years old, and Taj Portia, 12 years old, and a 15-year-old family friend that was just spending the night. Sean Anthony Rodriguez would take his last breath in that house as well. Investigators later determined that an accelerant had been used in the fire and that all the victims died of smoke inhalation and exposure to the fire. A gas can was located in the residence. 
The fire was ruled an arson, and all the deaths ruled a homicide. The family members of Coleman had been hit, and like the things you see only in movies, it just happened in Philadelphia. On Friday, October 8, 2004, one day before the arson, Coleman was brought over to the FBI interview room for a meeting with law enforcement agents, his counsel, and counsel for the government. While being transported, Coleman encountered Savage in a nearby cell, who menacingly pointed to Coleman with his hand in the shape of a gun. Savage had been transported to the court the same day for a hearing concerning a potential conflict of counsel. The very next day, his family would be demolished, destroyed, no longer existing. All of these plans were outlined by Cavani as he instructed his sister to make things happen, all recorded on a jail phone prior to them happening. But again, another judge on October 13, 2004, would grant permission to listen in on Cavani's visits at the jail with his family. The feds wanted more evidence of the destruction that he had caused. On October 28, 2004, Savage received a visit at the FDC from his mother, Barbara Savage, and sister Kadita Savage. During the visit, Savage asked how Popeye Lamont Lewis was doing. Barbara Savage responded that Popeye was calming down. Savage discussed with Barbara and his sister that various people of Savage's associates continued to owe him money, and he instructed his sister to help with collecting those debts. Additionally, Savage would tell Kadita to tell Cuzzo, Savage's cousin, Raymond Wilmore, to go get Kurt, a reference to Curtis Singleton, who was pistol whipped by Savage after he was accused by Savage of stealing drug proceeds, an incident that formed the basis for one of the firearm charges that he would be charged with. When Kadita told Savage that Kurt was not home yet, Savage said to tell Popeye that that dude came down here and said something. Savage advised Kadita and Barbara that he did not know what he said, but to make sure that Kurt does not come to court. On November 18, 2004, during another family visit at the FDC, Savage attempted to communicate with Barbara and Kadita through the use of hand gestures. This was observed by the FBI as they watched the concealed video surveillance of the meeting. During one particular hand gesture, Kadita held her hand in the shape of a gun and pretended to pull the trigger of the gun three times. It is not known in what context this gesture was made, however, because Kadita was whispering and or mouthing her words at the time. Although the visiting room, which was divided by a glass portion, had a two-way telephone to assist the communication between inmates and their visitors, the savages made no attempt to use the telephone during any of their visits. It was all sign language. The cards were being stacked against him, and in many instances, he became the master of his own demise. Kabani was serving himself up on a platter to the feds and had no clue that he was being recorded at every step of the way. The calls that were being intercepted showed that KSO was the most ruthless drug organization Philly had ever seen at that point. The recordings painted the picture in one, another inmate told Savage that by the time of trial, everybody be dead. Savage replied, we're just getting started. The night's still young, my boy. And another, commenting on Eugene Coleman's mother, Marcella Coleman, who perished in the October 9th arson, Savage would state, I'm glad that bitch died. Savage stated that Coleman was trying to hurt Savage by testifying against him, so Savage was going to try and hurt him. In another call, Savage said that when he sees them around in the city, He's going to get their motherfucking ass and their kids. Everybody going to pay. Savage told another prisoner about a previous conversation he had with co-defendant Malik Jones. When Savage had heard that Jones was thinking about cooperating, Savage said he asked Jones, what you going to do? Where you going to live? I'm the only one locked up out of my crew. They out there waiting, just like puppies and hound dogs. Paul Daniels, another co-defendant, would plead guilty, and he too would cooperate. He would tell federal prosecutors that he learned that Kebani told Bay that he was cooperating. Bay would personally tell Daniels through jail bars that kept him safe for the moment that all I need is one phone call or one visit and then watch my magic, motherfucker. Daniels was Savage's partner's son, Gerald Thomas's son, and he did not want to go to prison. In order to avoid a lengthy jail sentence, he took a chance with his life in every meaning of the word. A week after meeting at the federal building while housed in the same jail, Daniels would be summoned to talk through the toilet bowl a way of communicating with other prisoners from cell to cell. Daniels was in a cell on another floor right below the people who were once his friends. Dewad Bay and Savage would tell him, quote unquote, feds were bluffing and that he was going to kill Daniels' son. When Daniels stated that he could not hear a part of the conversation, Daniels could not make out the word bluffing. Savage remarked, oh, he can't hear me now? I'm going to kill his son. 
They repeated Savage's statement. He said, he's going to kill your son, bro. Savage was not bluffing. And Daniels knew that he was in the killing business. On November 14, 2004, the feds would intercept another toilet bowl call. Savage and Muse were discussing how P. Paul Daniels approached Unc, Gerald Thomas, and talked about cooperating. Savage said that they, Daniels, and others were hollering up through the bowl, so he told them to put that dude Daniels on. Savage then described the conversation between him and Daniels. He like, oh, no, I was just trying to get out of the way. I said, remember what you said, dude, because uh, I want you to keep in mind one thing. I'm the only one locked up out of my crew. The only. And Cool, the Wild Bay, the only one locked up out of his crew. Think about what you're going to do, man, because your son, he history. Man, why are you getting into that? Um, I'm listening. I got to tell you how I feel. Everything must go. Kibani would go to trial on the drug charges just before Christmas on December 16, 2005. The jury would come back with a finding of guilt on 14 of the 16 charges. When sentencing day came, the government would argue that Savage sold over 150 kilograms of cocaine in the city of Philadelphia. They would ask that the court impose a life sentence. Life in prison, though, was the least of his worries. In the end, the judge would impose a sentence of 30 years, likely knowing that Kebani has more charges coming. Charges that would cost him his life, literally. Another indictment was dropped in 2007 while Kabani was serving his 30-year sentence. In 2009, the government would drop what is called a superseding indictment. This time, the stakes were high. Kabani would be charged with numerous murders, including those from the firebombing. The government would also seek the death penalty. As part of that indictment, the feds had also arrested Popeye, Lamont Lewis, the alleged perpetrator of the firebombing. Federal prosecutors were going hard. They wanted a conviction, and they wanted to leave Kabani's blood on the razor wire. The trial would start in 2013 and go on for weeks. Popeye would later become the government's star witness in the firebombings. On May 14, 2013, Kabani Savage's life would forever change. The jurors walked into the courtroom, some with their heads down. Others looked on in disgust. Perhaps he already knew what his fate would be. Guilty. Next would be the sentencing phase, where the jury find that Kabani should be strapped to a deathbed and pumped with drugs that would take his last breath. The jury ordered that Kabani be sentenced to death, and on June 7th, the federal judge made it official, ordering that the death penalty be fulfilled. In fact, the judge imposed 13 death sentences. Popeye was sentenced to 40 years. Merritt, the person who was alleged to have thrown the gas cans into the house, was spared the death penalty, but he too was sentenced to life. As for Kabani's sister, she too found the same fate as Merritt, life in prison. Kabani Savage is now at ADX Florence, still fighting, but fighting a fight that seems inevitable. In his words, tears of rage, I'm flooded. I'm, I'm flooded internally from him. Almost drown myself every night, man. Tears of rage, because these son of bitches gonna pay, man. They gonna pay. Or my name ain't what it is. My pop name wasn't what it was. They gonna pay. They kids gonna pay. They mama's gonna pay. I know you get tired of me saying it, man, but that's the kind of conviction I got for this shit, man. I'm dedicated to their death, man. They better hope and pray I go to jail for a long time. It don't matter. Because while I'm still living, I'm going to get them. After hearing that story, you're probably thinking the same thing I was thinking, right? That's the type of shit that only happens in movies. But not really. That stuff happens out here on the streets. And you know, we always come back to this. You got to ask yourself, man, what are you worth? You know, a lot of dudes jump in the game and I do a lot of legal work. And you start... Thinking, man, I'm coming in this game, man, to get a couple of dollars. But when you start getting a couple of dollars, you start climbing the ladder. Then you start getting more dollars. And when you start getting more dollars, other people want what you got, right? The police come knocking. They ain't messing with you when you're low level, unless they catch you on a humbug. But as you start to escalate, people are talking about you. And when the feds show up, you can have all the power in the world in the streets in your city. But when they show up, they got the real power. They got the real power to put your lights out, man. They got the real power to put you in prison until the sun burns out. And that's what happened with Kebani. That's what happened with his sister. That's what happened with his friends and his people. 40 years, life, life, death penalty. Wow. And ironically, man, in this case, you know, for those that don't know, Kebani had a nine-year-old daughter. She was also killed in a drug turf war, accidentally shot and killed, not Nothing related to him, but just some other stuff that was going on. The man lost his daughter. 
lost his life. And again, man, you got to ask yourself, what do you work? Ain't nothing worth losing your life, man. I'm keeping it 100 with you. When you're sitting in that cell, even if you only got 15 or 20 years, ain't it crazy to say even if you only? 15, 20 years, man, there'd be plenty of times, man, where most men, you go to bed hungry sometimes. You could have, your cow could be full. You get locked down for 60 days, 90 days. Somebody done got killed at the prison. Stomach's touching your back. Missing your family. Can't call your family on Christmas. It hurts, man. It hurts. It's Christmas time, man. So think about Christmas. Think about where you really want to be on Christmas. Is it really worth it? The game's over, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. With respect until tomorrow, we're out. Thank <music> you.